Good morning, church family. So, we are in this series called The Gospel Lens. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn there with me this morning. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, how many, raise your hand if, if you like games, right? Anybody? Okay, got a couple. My wife and I really love uh, card games, board games, and then there's this kind of, I don't know if it's a new invention, I feel like it's new to me, but they're, they're called yard games. I mean, obviously, I think we've all heard of like cornhole, but now the, the fun thing is to take normal games and make them bigger, and then you play them in your yard, like there's Connect Four, and then right here down front, what you see is you see yard or large Jenga. Uh, and, and it's a fun thing to do. You get outside when it's not 1,000 degrees or 85 in the fall, uh, and you go outside and you play uh, the, these games in your yard, and it's really cool. And what I love about uh, games like this is there's always strategy involved in these games, and uh, the key for, for Jenga is not just to have your turn and then uh, let the opponent go, but the key is really long-term strategies. Like the purpose of Jenga, in case you don't understand, is to pull out a, a block. Each person will have a turn, and they will pull out a block without the entire tower falling. And your hope as the player is to kind of set up your opponent so that when they pull out their block, that they will make the entire tower fall tumble down on the ground. And so really the strategy of Jenga is to outlast your opponent. And so every move you make, every decision that you have in this game is to ensure the opponent's failure and really the long-term end goal is to do that. So when I take my turn, I'm not just thinking, how, do I, how can I get my one piece out so that I don't die because you will die that way in this game. That's how it happens. The goal is to take my piece out while also ensuring that you will die. And that's how I view games. It's death. It's not just losing. I'm going to kill you in this game, right? And so that, that, that's the point of Jenga is to kind of see the end result at play in every move that you make. And so as we dive into the text this morning, what I want to remind you of and what I think Paul is going to show us is that every decision that we make in our daily lives should be based on an end goal. There is an end goal, an ending victory in mind when Paul walks these Colossians, Colossians through Scripture. He, he writes this letter to them and he says, what I want you to remember is that there is something that you are working towards. There's something that you are looking and fixing your eyes towards. And it's not the everyday, but it is the end goal. So, Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, reads it this way, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. If you can remember back to last week, we discussed who Jesus is. And we discussed as a part of who Jesus is, where Jesus is, and this text lets us, lets us know, again, it reminds us, He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And these attributes allow the Christ follower, the believer in Jesus, to put their faith firmly in Jesus. Because He wasn't just this historical figure that spoke a lot of sweet nothings. No, He was the Son of God, and He came to eradicate your separation from the Father. He came to close the gap and say, you were once in sin and now you are a new creation and I will bring you back to the fold, back to the Father through my blood. And so what Paul is going to talk to us this morning about, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is to fix our eyes on Jesus and run the race. We need to remember that God is in control, and we need to let our lives be a representation of that belief. See, I don't know about you, but sometimes I lose control, and I try to do things myself. And I, I wanted to make sure that it's very clear that I say I lose control, because what God wants me to do is God wants, wants me to allow Him to take control and so what I do in sin is I try to take control for, from Him, and that is me losing control. 
Because when I am firmly put in the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, I have control because He has control. Does that make sense? That's some, a weird language of putting it. But when Jesus is at the forefront of my life, all things will work for good. But when I try to take over and try to run my life my way, things will break down. And so Paul continues in this text to the, to the Colossians, chapter 3, beginning back in verse 3. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So Paul's going to teach us a really big phrase right here. It's this, this teaching of eschatology. And what that means is he's kind of teaching of, some of you might call it end times, but really it's the, the last things. Paul is going to re- reveal to us these last things, this eschatology word it comes from the Greek, and eschata means literally last things, and obviously logia or, or ology, as some, as you, some may call it, is really the study of. So what Paul is going to get you and I to do is he's going to say, look, you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ, meaning that as a Christ follower, at the end of times, as you may call it, when the Father looks at you, He's not going to see your sins. He's going to see the blood of Christ. So you are hidden in Christ. And because you are hidden in Christ, when Christ who is your life appears, is what He says, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So Paul is getting these believers and you and I to understand that accepting Jesus is about this ending glory. It it is not as much about the everyday doldrum things of this world, but at, at some point, we will be with Christ in glory. I mean, that's a big thing to think about. That's one of those kind of mind-blowing, worldview-shattering concepts to go that there will be a day at the, the last days where we as Christ followers will be raised with Christ in glory. That will be a majestic moment in our lives. And then we will live eternally with Him in the new heaven and the new earth. And Paul is getting the believer and and you and I today to see this because he understands that the work of the everyday can become very taxing. It can become a very difficult thing to wrap your head around because you're going, okay, I'm just, why am, what, what is the end result of me just working for Jesus? So that I can kind of be in heaven? Like, what is the, what is the end result of, of putting to death some things and putting on new things just so that I can be in heaven? And what Paul is trying to get you to say is yes, but it's something so much more glorious than just being in heaven or just getting your fire insurance. Like, you will be with Christ in glory. This is a reminder to those who have trusted in Jesus that your life is not your own. Paul, telling the Corinthian church, says you are not your own. You were bought with a price. When the turning of ages comes, meaning when when Jesus comes and restores this world to its former glory, then all those who lost their life by giving it to Jesus will gain their life in the new heaven and new earth. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Paul is attempting to get you and I to remember the end goal because he knows that when we can focus on the end goal when we can keep in mind the end the ending strategy it will have lasting impacts in our everyday path so with the ending strategy in mind that as Christ followers we will be risen with him in glory What steps are you taking today in light of the glorious ending that will come? I think speaking of ending times and the last days and and some of those things can be very unnerving for some. And what I hope that comes from this passage and from our time this morning is that it is a joyous moment where 
as Christ's followers, we will be reunited with our Father. We will be reunited and we will be made clean, made whole again. And brokenness will be gone. Sin will be gone. Disease will be gone. And you and I will live in harmony. We need to remember the end goal so that our everyday life will be in efforts to see that end goal come to fruition. I think most of the time when we preach or we listen to sermons, we want things that are applicable to our life today. We don't necessarily want them to be applicable for tomorrow or certainly not down the road, but we must remember that in order for application to be derived today, we must see the end goal for tomorrow. When athletes train, do they just kind of go at it haphazardly? No. They have an end goal in mind. I was just talking to Jody out in, in, in the lobby, and he's the athletic trainer for Tattnall Square Academy, and he's talking about training and how there's a huge difference between training for football or football, right? Like, not same, same. In one, you want kind of, you know, compact, larger muscles and, and very explosive. And in the other one, you want kind of long, leaner muscles that allow for more reps and, and, and kind of endurance. And so when the athlete trains, they train very differently because they see the end in a very different way from another Athlete. When the entrepreneur begins one of their endeavors, they begin with an end in mind. And so why, as Christ followers, should we not look towards the end in our everyday? We should. It should be something that fuels us. It should be something that motivates us to live for Christ every single day. To put on the Gospel lens. The writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so loosely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Running with the end in sight it's very important. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, there was a popular movie, I think I have a, a picture, uh, on Netflix called Bird Box. And this entire movie is kind of, uh, you know, it's, I think it's like one of those horror or thriller movies. And in, in my, my child's language of explaining movies, the bad guy is like this ghost thing that you don't want to look at. And the good guy is just these people who don't want to look at the bad thing, right? Well, out of this movie, Netflix tried to get some uh, some movement and some people to kind of try to watch this movie because it was all about being blindfolded so they couldn't see the bad guy. And the, the movie is not the focus. I'm not endorsing the movie by any way, shape, or form. But what I am saying is Netflix, trying to create a like hashtag bird box movement, went out and uh, talked to these people on Twitch. Raise your hand if you know what Twitch is. I want to see. Okay, good. I'll explain it to you. So back in the day, right, we went outside and played games. And then evolution happened and then you know we played games inside on a Nintendo and then another step in our evolution of gaming happens now people literally watch other people play video games ie twitch that's where that comes in kids will literally sit around on the on their YouTube channels or twitch and they will watch other kids play video games <laughs> right so Netflix does this thing called Bird Box Challenge. And so they get a bunch of big, famous gamers to play these video games with blindfolds on. And it gets pretty popular. As a matter of fact, it goes viral. And because of its popularity, others started performing just normal tasks in their life using the hashtag Bird Box Challenge. So they do the dishes with their blindfold on. They would cook dinner with their blindfold on. And then some really intelligent people decided to drive cars with their blindfold on. I think I even have a picture of one really intelligent human being. He's, you know, leaders of our, of our country, guys. Here it is. And I think the important part for us to remember from this kind of idiotic movement that happened is that you do not get to your destination without looking at your destination. Life 
is not a movie. Like, we have to be looking at where we are going. Very rarely in life will you get to a desired goal without taking intentional steps on getting to this goal. So the bird box challenge is not really going to work for your faith. In, in order to get to this end goal where you were raised with Christ in glory, there are some things that we need to do today. And that's what Paul is going to inform the Colossians of. Like, hey, think about the end goal. Think about where you'll be. You'll be with Christ in glory. But how do we do it? Well, obviously the first step he talked about in verse 1 is to recognize that you're a sinner and put your faith in Jesus. But once you've put your faith in Jesus... How do we fix our eyes? How do we run the race with endurance? How do we run well? So he'll continue on. Verse 5. He says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander and obscene talk from your mouth do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator so there are three takeaways that i want us to kind of understand in this text there are three things that will allow us to fix our eyes on jesus and run the race with endurance getting to this end goal that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wants us to see. And the first one is that we are to stop walking in our former lives. We are to stop walking in our former lives. So there's a distinction that I want us to recognize in this text that Paul is kind of laying out for us, that there is a difference between sinning and living in sin. There is a difference between sinning and living in sin. To live in sin is to settle. To accept the wrong actions taken against God Himself in direct insubordination to His commands with regularity. So you could say to live in sin is to kind of accept the sin that is in your life and to just continue to to do it and to live like it doesn't necessarily matter. Rather, to, to sin... It is, a, it is let me say, is an act against God the same, but to simply sin, one would hope, one would, would certainly argue that the, the person who just sins and doesn't live in sin feels a conviction, feels a, a, a dirtiness, feel, feels a, a need to fight against that sin. And they do not accept to just live in it. Some may not even be aware of the specific sin. And so, just because you sin doesn't mean that you um, won't do it on, with some sense of regularity, but there's a difference between sinning and, and living in sin, meaning living in sin is just kind of an acceptance of it. Like, you're, it's okay. God gives me grace. Whereas to sin is to understand that we are broken and we will fight against that sin every single day. And in our efforts as churches to hold each other accountable, sometimes we do a really bad job of recognizing the difference between living in sin and simply sinning. Maybe when we hear of a public sin, you can think about sins that are oftentimes very public. We, we can come to quick conclusions and we can judge that person and we can assume that that maybe lapsed moment of judgment on their behalf is a lifestyle or is them living in sin where in, in reality it quite possibly could have just been a single moment that they just made some bad decisions. I want to be clear. Sin is sin. I'm not marginalizing it. I'm not trying to say that one is necessarily worse than the others. However, living in sin requires a very different response than simply sinning. Think about your children. Or think about when you were a child. Maybe something happened at school and your child comes home or you come home to your parents and it was really just a one-time thing. Hopefully what you would have received in that moment of that one-time lapse of judgment 
is maybe a, a stern talking to and, and maybe a little bit of discipline and maybe just kind of a, 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 some correctional things. Now let's go back and say this one thing turned into a habit. This is something that you did on a regular basis. My son, like his father, has a smart mouth, right? He likes to just talk a little too much, and he likes to kind of let everybody know who he is in the room. It's going to get him in trouble one day. It's going to happen. It already has. He's five. And so the first time he comes home and teacher says something, that's one discussion that he and I are going to have. The 15th time, it's going to be a very different discussion. You know what I'm saying? Like, there will be punishment. It is no longer discipline. It is no longer, uh, it's okay, son, you know, work it. It's, let me take my belt off. Like, it's, you know, it's, we're going to fix this. Let's, let's turn this doorknob around and lock, I can't, I can't say that we're on camera, right? There's a lot of things that will happen with my child the 15th time they mess up as opposed to just the first so think about it in those senses. There, there's a huge difference when somebody does one, something once and somebody does something often. They do it over and over and over again. In the church, we need to remember that we need to hold each other accountable. We need to lift each other up. This living in sin versus sin is where church discipline comes into play. This, this is where we as a church, as a group of body, a body of believers, hold each other accountable and lift each other up. When one of us sins, you know, okay, hey. But when one of us is like just completely acting out of that sin, what we should do as a body of believers that cares about this person, that cares about each other, that cares about Christ's church, is we should look at, look at that person and say, hey, bro, you messed up. You need to stop this now. Fix it. You need to remember that you are a new creation in Christ. Do not live in the old ways. Put them to death and put on the new self. And I, I realize this can be a difficult task for some because maybe you were saved when you were a young child. And so when you read Scripture verses that say, put off the, the old ways or the old self, you're going, I don't even remember my life before Christ. And I think Paul would respond in, in a manner to say that what you need to remember is even if you don't recognize how you were before or, or, or recall those things in your life how you were before, you need to know that you are a new creation now. Like you are in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. And so if the world accepts one way of life, there's a solid chance that you as a Christ follower shouldn't live that way. Don't live like the world. So the, the first point is that we are to stop walking in our former lives. The second thing is that we need to recognize that God gives us good gifts. And we break them. Christmas is coming soon and, and inevitably someone will get a gift. And they'll be super excited whether it's a child or maybe you an adult out there. You're going to get a gift on Christmas and you're going to be super excited. You're going to get it ready. You're going to do all the setup. You're going to go out there and it's going to break. When I was a kid, I got a toy. It was an RC flamethrower car. It was like a remote control car. And it didn't throw flames because it was a bad toy. It, at a certain point, when it got a certain level of speed, it would throw flames, and it was the coolest thing ever. I unwrapped it on Christmas, and I was stoked. I took it outside, and I played with it. It was amazing. It was back, you know, back in the day when I lived in Atlanta when we actually might have had cold weather on Christmas. It was really cool. I'm outside freezing, and there's like flamethrowers coming from my car, and about three hours later, my car broke. I was, I was torn up. I was broken hearted that my toy broke. And this is what we do to the gifts that God gives us. We break them. In that former list, Paul mentions several sins. And the very first sins that Paul mentions are sexual. And we need to remember that he was given us a gift. And somehow we broke it. Genesis chapter 2 Verse 24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother 
and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And all the married people in the room said, Amen. No chuckle, y'all are dry this morning. Okay, I hear you. It's cool. It's cool. When we use the gifts the way that God intended us to use them, good things come. They don't break. They are blessings, not burdens. When a man and woman come together in holy matrimony and then become one flesh, we are using the gift as God deemed it so. And many churches today are taking a stance on marriage. Some are taking the stance and saying that they are open and affirming. If you don't know what that means, it means that they are affirming the full inclusion, meaning the full acceptance of a membership of a part of their body of the LGBTQ people. And I want to be very clear, this is not biblical. This is not biblical. Piedmont has always and will always be a place for people from all walks of life. But we need to be clear on one thing. The church exists as a unified body of Christ followers who worship Jesus. And as such, we have theological and doctrinal beliefs that we adhere to. And in love, our church membership, our belongership, you know, the way that you call this place home, is limited to those who affirm our theological and doctrinal beliefs and whose lives match those who are striving to follow after Jesus. Now this is an important note I want you to make sure that you heard because I didn't say people who were free of sin. I didn't say those who have achieved a certain benchmark of sinlessness. But those who are not openly living in sin and against the Word of God. You can look at a number of factors in our world that reveal our brokenness when receiving God's gift of sex. We have high abortions, diseases, broken homes, anxiety and depression, body image issues, pornography, and the list goes on when we take a good gift given by us from God and we distort it, we break it, brokenness stems from that. Paul has a second list. He talks about language. And language is an important thing in our culture and in our world because Who else, what other creature in our universe can speak? Think about the power of speech. What did God do to create the universe? He spoke it into existence. He breathes life into Adam. He speaks to us by a special revelation in His Word. And God has given us the ability to speak. To breathe life. And this is, in a special, this is a special gift that God gives us. To speak the Word of God into the people around us. Because when we can proclaim His Word, what happens? It doesn't come back null and void. People go from death to life in the proclamation of His Word. Revelation happens. Death from life happens. Or death to life, I should say. Paul lists these things to to let us know that brokenness is a part of our world. As unfortunate and as disconcerting as it is, it's all around. But this is not an excuse to, to give up. Rather, it is a reason to fight harder and a reason to lean in. We need to remember that the governments of this world will not fix our problems. Our leaders are gifts, but they are human and therefore are broken. We do not trust that the government will restore goodness. We trust that God will restore goodness. So ensure that you are not finding your identity in a leader. You are not finding your identity in a political party, but you are finding your identity in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He is the only one that gives us a better way. So again, the first point, we're to stop walking in our former lives. The second is we need to recognize that God gives us good gifts and we break them. And the third is that there is a better way. Paul continues, Colossians 3, verse 11. He says, 
Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, Forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must do also. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body. Be Thankful. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual th- songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Paul begins and he takes us through the dirt so that we can get to this clean picture at the end where he says, look, we have broken things. Absolutely. But know that there's a better way in Christ. Like, don't just live in your brokenness. Accept that I have a good and perfect way. Fight harder. Lean in. Do not succumb to this world. And he's referencing the fruit of the Spirit here to to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control, and gentleness. Like, lean in to what God has for you. Church, in your everyday life, look towards the end knowing that God has a better way for you today. You do not have to live in your former ways. You put it to death because Christ with every nail, put it to death for you. You can live in the fullness of Jesus by fixing your eyes and living in the Spirit and putting on the fruit. But this requires something of you. It's a free gift, but you've got to take it. Like it, it's, it's just sitting there, but you've got to reach out and take it. just like your morning or evening routine, you need to consciously and consistently recognize the daily struggles in light of the ending glory. Many of us have routines in the morning and the evening. I make fun of my wife a lot at home. Well, maybe on the stage too. Love you, babe. Because she has routines. She's a a very routine-oriented person. And for her to get up in the morning, it takes about 15 or longer minutes just to, like, leave her bedroom. Whereas it takes me, like, 2.2 seconds. She gets up, and first thing, she has to, like, brush her teeth. She has to has to brush her teeth. And she does something with her hair and, you know, whatever else. And, and then she finally leaves the bathroom. Don't talk to her yet. It's not talking time yet. Because she will go downstairs to the coffee pot that is brewed and warm waiting on her, just ah, screaming her name. And then you still don't talk to her. Because she has to drink a cup of coffee first. She she has this routine. She has to go through it. And then my two-year-old and my five-year-old and myself can speak to mom. If we don't want to get our head bit off. And just like the routine that we have in the morning or the evening of maybe brushing your teeth or getting your coffee or putting your PJs on at night, whatever that is. Wearing a mask, you know, y'all wear those like green masks, make your face look all pretty. We need to put on the gospel lens and recognize the end result of 
being raised with Christ in glory. Because that will give you fuel to make it through the dark days, the tough times. To don't just get bogged down in what's happening every single day, but to remember that the battle has already been won. That that little problem or hiccup or speed bump in your life today is a thing that God allowed you to go through for the purification and sanctification of your soul. He is turning you into a new creation, so put to death the old ways in Christ and put on the new created gospel lens that Jesus has given you.